Hey, Debbie Kitterman here. Before we jump into today's podcast episode, I want to invite you to join me for two events that I have coming up. The first one is the Remembrance Workshop. It is a one day live online virtual event, and I want live online virtual event. That's right. We're in early bird pricing right now. And so I want to invite you to come and register and join me for Saturday, May 4th for the Remembrance Workshop. It is 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, right now, that early bird pricing ticket is available to you. If um, you are wanting the recordings, uh, that is not included with the early bird low pricing. You're going to have to add in addition to your regular ticket price that's in early bird pricing right now. Best price it's ever going to be. So get in today. Um, You need to add on the VIP ticket. Their recordings will be there. You can see all the other bonuses that you're going to get for the VIP. VIP ticket add-on, but it is also at the lowest price. So you want to go register today and plan to join me for the Remembrance Workshop. I've got some great speakers that are going to come. I got a new one to introduce to you. It is going to be a power-packed day. If you're like, what is this Remembrance Workshop about? And you have not listened to my previous podcast episode on um, remembering, um, I talk a little bit more in depth about that. So I want to invite you to join us. You can go to DebbieKitterman.com. And you can click on the events tab and you'll see all the details right there and can register from the website. The other event that I have is called Ready to Launch. And this is for my authors, book writers, product launchers, kingdom entrepreneurs. If you have something that you're needing to launch and you're needing to get out there and you want to be set up for success so that you're ready to blast off when it is go time, then you want to sign up for this three day live online virtual event. That's right. Three days live online virtual event. Right now, it is in early bird ticket pricing as well. And if you want the recordings for that, you have to add on the VIP ticket with all the goodies that come with that um, in addition to your regular registration costs. But I want to invite you to join me for these two events. Again, go to DebbieKitterman.com and check the events tab and you can register straight from there. And if you have any questions, you can email me. Enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we equip you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. I am delighted and honored to have back in the studio, Randy Kay. If you haven't heard our other podcast interviews on his other books, I'll put them in the show notes so you can do that. But we're going to talk about his brand new book, Heaven Stormed. This is such a powerful book. I had the honor of writing an endorsement and a kind of reading in advance before it actually hit the market. But Heaven Stormed is a heavenly encounter and it reveals your assignment in the end times outpouring and tribulation. So if you don't know who Randy Kay is, let me tell you about him. And then we're going to dive right into our conversation. So Randy Kay is an ordained minister and he founded Randy Kay Ministries to bring the great news of Jesus Christ to the world through inspiring stories and messages, including Christ centered afterlife experiences. Randy's work can be found in his revelations from heaven vodcast, the heaven encounters TV show on Sid Ross is supernatural network and two Christian dudes podcast with his co-host Sean Tabbitt, who I've had on the podcast with me before too. Um, and the heaven on earth podcast with co-host Taylor Jensen and several other places you can find Randy as well. And we'll put his links in the show notes so that you can do that. But, um, prior to his ministry, Randy was an executive in the healthcare industry, having led operations for a fast growing neurobio pharmaceutical company in the world. He was CEO of a biotech company, marketing and clinical director director of two cardiovascular companies and training director um, and consultant for ministries and fortune 100 companies. He also developed the first validated course for thriving in life. Randy and his wife, Renee live in San Diego area and they have two grown children and two grandchildren. Well, Randy, such a list of accomplishments. Welcome back to the podcast. That just means I'm old. <laughs> that's, that's all it means. <laughs> uh, but you look so young and you are young at heart and that is what counts. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, thank you. Well, I am so excited because I I love this book. And I said this on your um, your book launch that you did, the virtual book launch, that I think this is your best book yet. I love all your books. Um, Dying to Me, Jesus. And then, um, but I think my favorite one until this one came out was Your Revelations from Heaven. That one, I just love this one. But this Heaven Stormed book, to me, is your best by far. 
And um, I think other people are saying that as well. But I, um, I think, Randy, you always handle these topics with such grace and humility, but with a solid biblical foundation. And I love that about you. Um, so I wanted to just jump in and talk about heaven stormed and, um, and what it's about, like give a little synopsis cause you break it into three different parts. Um, and so I'm just going to let you talk for a little while and I'll interject and ask some questions, but, um, I love the three parts. It was your life review, which I loved getting to know some more of your backstory, um, and how you and Renee met and then meeting Jesus. And then the last day. So you kind of broke it into three parts, but, um, give us a little synopsis of heaven stormed for people who may not have heard of you or read any of your other books, which I can't believe, but you know, possible. <laughs> Well, I um, had clinically died. It was uh, from a long, we never really discovered how my blood started clotting, but I had let it go for a long time. I was riding up the coast of California. As, uh, as you know, there's a long coast. And so I was uh, riding my bicycle and realized I had pain in my calf and then I couldn't breathe. I uh, went in to get a... Uh, uh, some medicine or something to uh, help with the inflammation. And then I came to the floor, I was rushed to the ER, and there were seven blood clots uh, in my body that had traveled up to the pulmonary artery, including the blood flow to the lungs. There was a patient next to me who had a highly contagious bacterial strain that was drug resistant. Uh, I got the infection through the IV, so my body started clotting all over, and uh, I flatlined. So we know from the hospital records that I had uh, been clinically dead, heart stopped for a little over 30 minutes. But in terms of the kind of the background of all of it, so I hadn't shared, uh, Debbie, my experience for 14 years. I uh, didn't want to. I uh, felt that it was my treasure with the Lord and that I, I felt that if I did share, it would change my life, which uh, Don Piper, who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven, told me, you know, if you share this, you're going to be, uh, once you share it, your life is going to change. Well, I was invited to God TV to interview on a business book I had written on our research on thriving in life. And the interviewee, interviewer, I should say, uh, was my former pastor. And he said, I'd like to ask you about your uh, afterlife experience. And I said, well, you know, if you feel the Lord wants you to, I guess I'll, you know, sure. I mean, but, but I'm, I don't really want to. I did. The cat was out of the bag. Long story short, then, is that uh, I shared then with that, uh, that first book, which is really intended uh, to share more the thriving aspect of how we can turn sorrow to joy. Mm -hmm. And the more people wanted to learn about the afterlife experience that I had. And then Heaven Stormed. Um, now, Heaven Storm was a book I never wanted to write uh, because I was told explicitly by the Lord when I was in heaven that I could not share about Heaven Storm. And so... I, you know, when, when I found out through a series of signs and other things that the Lord was releasing me, I started to write this. As you noted, there are three parts. The first part has to do with kind of my, my life, which I thought nobody wants to read about that. I mean, that's, that's not going to, that's not rele uh, relevant to the story or how I, my experience in heaven. And the Lord kept saying, just, just do it. Start, start doing it. And I, I think like you, Debbie, we're planners, you know, we, you're, you're a teacher, instructor for writers. You know, we, we put the, um, we put the outline of the book and do all of those things. And the Lord was saying, no, 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 just write. And so I started doing it and it was about the story that of my life. I had a troubled childhood asthma, you know, overweight, got picked on, bullied uh, in the hospital and out of the hospital because I was sickly. I stuttered, had all kind of speech impediments. I was not, a, I was 
was I was really had a somewhat of a torturous childhood growing up, not because of my parents, just because of uh, all of my ailments and, and the uh, kids, as we know, and, and teenage years, early teenage years, how they can be. So anyway, I was going through this and thinking, Lord, well, how is this relevant? And then I realized in the midst of it, as he was authoring this on my behalf, I felt very strongly that these were the life reviews that I had in heaven. So I was, I was detailing these f as they were in the events and timeline that they occurred, and then how in heaven Jesus was elucidating the reasons for those but moreover, how he redeemed each aspect of my life. And I saw through these life reviews that the Lord had uh, called out from my, my life that I had documented that he was going through a period not only of redemption, but weaving together a purpose throughout, even in the tough times, even in the most difficult times, how he was orchestrating my life so that I would eventually come to know him because I had become an ardent agnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting uh, when I, at Northwestern University. We did a study uh, getting uh, students off campus. I was trying my best to to speak against Christians, uh, given any opportunity, how they're, you know, this way and that way and trying to discredit the Bible and all of these things. And yet he had weaved together uh, through an accident where I almost died, meeting a Christian for the first time. I thought all Christians were hypocrites who really uh, walked the talk. And he came to lead me to know him as Lord and Savior. Mm. But I had a crisis of faith, and that led me to my event uh, when I went to heaven, having kind of doubted my faith. And that's why I entered into uh, the beginning of the storm, which was seeing the spiritual warfare going on. Yeah. And then the storm itself was the unfolding of the end times, which I was instructed specifically not to share, which is why I had not included it previously. Yeah. And that was the part that was most difficult to uh, to author because, you know, tribulation, that's not a not a fun thing to to account. Uh, you know, we read the book of Revelation, all that. But but anyway, the Lord orchestrated all of that as well. And then I went into when I returned, I went into an extensive research to try to find out when and how the Lord would be unveiling uh, the end times. Yeah. Which, OK, there's so many things that I have so many questions to ask you based on what you just shared. Um, but I was intrigued by um, the first part of it where you were really sharing your your story and your life review. And I thought this is like you see the fingerprints of God and the supernatural happening around you the entire time, um, even though you weren't walking with the Lord. And I was just like. This is, I mean, to me, it was really cool because I was like, ah, but I related to so much of it in my own life too. Growing up in a very conservative church that didn't actually believe in the supernatural and any of that stuff. I was like, oh, I've had those experiences too. Like, it's interesting. You and like one of my favorite stories that you do share um, was, you know, the one house, which, which we're going to talk about the house on Blood Point Road. But, but early on, before you even got saved, when you were running with your college buddy which actually led you to say to god are you really real where you guys heard a voice you both heard this voice coming out of the graveyard and that the supernatural is real and um that it just and then your car accident and i just thought mm, the enemy has been after you for a long time but huh, hell lost another one i was singing that as i was reading it like i was like hell lost another one yeah uh, so <laughs> I, think, I think your story is so good but i did i did um one of the other things that you, you talked about was your life in review and that you got to see that in heaven. Why do you think that that was one of the things that, that you got to see in heaven and, and what's the purpose for, for our life review when we're in heaven? Well, it's oftentimes, uh, a, a remembrance of those who have returned from heaven, especially those who have died mm -hmm. uh, and gone to heaven, you know, absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So what I, nobody really, to my knowledge, because I've interviewed a lot of people who have 
died and gone on to heaven and some who have even gone on to hell as non-believers. Um, but many of them have had afterlife uh, uh, revelations uh, in their experience. And I, I, ne I really never fully understood that until I started documenting my own uh, well in advance of writing any book. But I just wanted to keep it fresh in my mind. And I believe the reason now that I know the, that the Lord uses life reviews uh, and I don't know if everyone has a life review going to heaven, but many of us do, is because there's not only a cathartic process of having gone through this life, of seeing the good times and the bad things, but even in the bad things, uh, seeing that, that you know, I was seeing these things that I'd done wrong, I was seeing not only, I was not seeing condemnation, I should say, I was seeing how the grace of Jesus Christ had redeemed those times. Mm. So there was, uh, there was not only a healing process through this, but seeing how the love of Jesus Christ, you know, that's one thing that is most profound. If there's a takeaway of any of our experiences, including yours truly, it should be that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him uh, should have life eternal. Well, that seems, we've read it so many times, it just doesn't strike as much as what it is in the profundity of what God does for us. He loves us so much that even when we hate him, as I did, as an agnostic, even when we are angry at God, he is not angry at us. He loves us through in the tenderest of ways. I asked Jesus, you know, when I was seeing these things and I thought, were you with me even when I was going through all of this suffering? So I was in the hospital. I couldn't breathe. Lungs collapsed. You know, doctors said, you know, I don't think he's, if he makes it, he's going to be uh, damaged. His lungs were, he won't live very long. And so I said, even then you were with me. I didn't even know you. I didn't know how a child really doesn't know about, you know, God or think about outside of just some cursory way. And he said, yes, even then I was with you. And you know what I, I felt? I didn't, I didn't feel like God had abandoned me. I didn't really have a cogency that God really existed at that time in, in, in a very personal way. I realized that even despite my lack of faith, he still knew my heart. And that's what the Lord was saying to me. He knew my heart. He knew my heart. He knew that this, that this kind of uh, selfish human being who just wanted to just, you know, leave humanity because it had been so cruel. All of these things that I, that he, he loved me so much that he knew my heart would, that he would, I, my heart would be receptive to him and that eventually I would come to know him as Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the most amazing part to me. Even when my best friend, I had no friends really to speak of. I had a dog and that was my friend. And when Jimmy, who was uh, my best and really only friend, and we'd stand at a bus stop and, and there was a gang next to us. Those who know geography know Camden, New Jersey is next door. There are a lot of gangs in Camden, New Jersey. Came over sometimes to, to taunt us or do terrible. Well, I couldn't, I, I, I was sick. I didn't go to the bus stop. They, they saw Jimmy there, had a thick uh, Southern accent, and they just assumed that he was, you know, he was uh, back then there was, you know, segregation and, you know, a lot of contention going on. I just assumed he was a you know bigoted young kid. Well, he didn't know. He didn't know an understanding of that. But they just bashed his head into a tree. Wow. Uh, a few weeks later, after he recovered, the father listed the house. They moved back to Alabama. Mm -hmm. I had no friends. And yet I asked the Lord about that. I didn't have any friends, Lord. He gave me this little dog to be the friend and pull me through. And he said, and I asked him about that. And again, he said, I knew your heart. I knew Jimmy's heart. 
And I and he said back to me something. He said something to the effect. He said, "Was it worth it? Was it all worth it?" And then I thought, when I was with him in heaven, absolutely, absolutely, here I was in paradise. But if I were to go back and go through that same, all of the, the suffering, all of the, the accidents when I was disabled for a period of time and, and, couldn't, and, and it couldn't walk, I would go back and do it all over again, knowing what I knew in heaven, because indeed it was all worth it. And I had no remembrance of, of the effect Mm-hmm. of any of these things. So even though the life review showed me you know, what had happened and the atrocities and when I was in the moment of those things, it was horrific. Even then, all of that he had redeemed so that it appeared just as the love of God working through all of that to bring me to the point where none of it had an effect in heaven. Certainly not a negative effect, but actually a positive effect because I was seeing that the love of God uh, weaved through my life in a very profound uh, and loving way. Yeah, that's it. It was so um, it was so good to just I think kind of read and see the fingerprints of God throughout your life. I think it, it's so important. I think for people to see that because um, and I know people God's never there. I'm like, no, he's he was there. So for you to share that, to experience that, and then to realize that he was there, even though you didn't know that he was there, um, I think is a is has is a testament to people, um, and. Um, Thank you for sharing that part, uh, because I, it's gonna it's gonna affect a lot of people. I think that that don't understand that that God is still with them. That even though they see these as hardships and they see these things as like I don't understand where you're really there, but He was, and that Him asking you the question was it all worth it? I remember. Um, our podcast interview. And I think it was the dying to meet Jesus book. And I, and we were talking about you meeting Jesus for the first time. And you share about a little bit of it here in heaven's storm, just a little bit. I'm not in, in as much detail as we talked about there, but you know, I think your words were, um, that love, love has a name and, uh, and, and I think that that changes everything when you felt that you experienced that when he was with you cheek to cheek and you were face to face with Jesus. And, um, that interview has marked me like when you shared that. And so I just, I just, I love your authenticity and I love, um, the humility with which you share with and you write with you, you say, um, this was interesting in your introduction. I wanted to ask for clarification um, because you said that you witness scenes from the end of times and then in parentheses, you put end times. Um, and so um, I thought that's a different phrasing. So in heaven, was it the end of times and we call it the end times um, or is that I just thought that was an interesting phrasing and I know you don't do anything by accident because <laughs> Holy Spirit was helping you write the book. <laughs> Well, the end of times, I feel, is more accurate than end times because the end times could be centuries, right? It could include whatever time frame. But the end of times is the end of times as God created us upon this earth. So the end of times is the culmination of all of time, but it is also the finishing of those times. So when we go back to even the Garden of Eden, you know, with Adam and Eve, we think of that as the beginning point then of uh, creation. Uh, Then there is this orchestration back to the redemption aspect of Jesus Christ through all of the rejections of God, all of the means in which he was tolerant of of a race who worshiped golden calves and all of this stupid stuff. He's just orchestrating something throughout. But what he's orchestrating is the end. Because he knows, having written this, authored this, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning of time, that eventually it would be the end of all time as we know it on this earth. Because in heaven there is no time. 
in heaven there is no uh, concept of time because it is irrelevant that is a, a human made construct mm -hmm. so when we speak of the end of time we're speaking of the human made construct of what we would ordain as time but in the infinity infinity or uh, the, that time which ends into all of time all of creation that extends beyond our minuscule time that we are on this earth so God knew that he would he would orchestrate a period of time that would be the last chapter and that last chapter is what I was seeing in heaven so when we think of the last chapter oftentimes we think of God's glory rapture tribulation um, the end of tribulation the apocalypse and then uh, Jesus coming down uh, through the clouds in his glory mm -hmm. and then he redeems not necessarily he redeems not necessarily the the earth uh, because the earth has been so sullied at this point I mean there are wars I mean we've had destruction and the like but he has to create a new heaven and a new earth then the clock that has been ticking throughout all of time ends mm. then we enter into the period of eternity where time has no meaning we're not no one wears clocks in heaven or in the new heaven and the new earth we don't we don't look at our watch you know when's our next meeting or whatever it's over at that time so time as we know it has finished and we enter into the space of eternity mm. where time has no relevance for us. You know, the Bible talks about that, you know, days is a thousand years and, and vice versa. It, it's, it's, it's so irrelevant. Mm. Uh, what we know is the perspective of life then is the reflection off of Christ. Because all of this time we have, the, what time does is it interferes with our relationship with Jesus. It, it makes all of the encumbrances of life, the schedules, the, the needs, the demands, uh, detractions from the Lord Jesus. But in the new heaven and the new earth, uh, there are no, no distractions whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The relationship aspect that we have with one another is unencumbered. It is pure. It is seeing through in heaven. It's seeing through the eyes of Christ. It is being redeemed not only in a redemption through our life, but total redemption. When we have a new body yeah. and we see things as they should be and what God has perfected in heaven is realized in every aspect of relationships and, and talents, abilities, uh, intentionality, everything that we desire on earth that we kind of get an inkling about is brought to the fullest extent in heaven. And then he creates this new earth where he pours that forth because now before was the was the communion with God is by the way Jesus is in his personhood is heaven heaven came to earth when he walked on the earth, on this earth but there he created this new earth which has a connection back to heaven and that connection is unimpeded Mm -hmm. so that we have that constant communion with the Lord, which is the most important. As you said, back to, you know, the encounter I had, I realized the first thought was, so this is love. Mm -hmm. But the first two words he spoke to me, which would be enduring words throughout, all, not all of my life, but should it be enduring words for everyone. The first two words he spoke to me were, trust me. So that trust would carry through everything back to, you know, is it was it worth it? Just hanging on to that rope. Trust me. Trust me. I'm going to I'm going to bring you to the end. Mm. And that end is going to bring you into an unending life with me in constant communion. That's the greatest hope that we can have is that enduring unending time will end here. But it continues and there will be no time yeah. and no end and no end i like that i like that you said in the introduction that life as we know it is about to change and that set the t the whole tone i think for the rest of the book with this anticipation of reading um your life in review and meeting jesus and then coming to the last days um section where you talked about that in the third section but um 
talk to us a little bit about for those that haven't read your book, um, how is it that, um, our life is about to change life as we know it is about to change. Yeah. Well, life as we know it is so skewed, Mm -hmm. you know, again, the caveat being the key word is know it life as we know it is very limited, very biased. Um, life as we know it is about to change. Um, it has kind of a double meaning, I think, Debbie. Mm-hmm. Life as we know it is one of kind of, well, you know, we get through this, you know, all of us have are living in our own end times, right? We're all going to, we all have an end point. So, but then we're thinking, okay, people are saying, especially today, I think, in light of the last days, they're thinking, when is the rapture? That's the most common question I get. When is the rapture? When is it going to happen? Tell me, because I want to get out of this world. <laughs> I don't want to go through the tribulation. I don't want to, I don't, I don't, just beam me up, Lord. You know, right. and, and so what, what is then the transference into kind of life is about to end is indeed mm. uh, the what we know from the book of Revelation, from Ezekiel, from Matthew, uh, is the endpoints of of what is the existence that we have here on earth. Uh, we've already had Israel. We know about the wars, rumors of war, uh, rumors of war, and and pestilence, COVID, and all, whatever. All of it has kind of transpired already. Mm-hmm. So now we're we're on this clock for our time. And so life is about to end. All of the comforts that we've had are it's about to end. And I think that's a healthy way to think of it mm-hmm. in living into the end times because we shouldn't be thinking about the rapture, you know, beam me up. We should be thinking about what God is is what he wants us to do in these very special last days. Yeah. All of it is about to change. The cursory superficial, you know, uh, uh, relationship with Jesus Christ, not going to cut it anymore. The um, the glory of God that we aspire to in the Western world happening to a large extent in the Eastern world, uh, especially in the persecuted church is going on, is about to change. Mm-hmm. The, the lukewarm Christian is going to, you know, be lost. And the, and the believer who really lives the life as unto the Lord, Colossians 3.23, on a 24-7, you know, because God speaks to our, our spirit when we're sleeping even, all of those things are about to change. And that's, that's the benefit, I think, I'll call it a benefit of being in what, what is the last day's generation, um, of being in these end times generation. Now, when I say generation, you know, maybe it's our baby, maybe it's our, I'm not talking about a time clock where I can say, okay, it's going to happen uh, within the span of time. But I believe uh, very strongly, and I spoke to, I was at a dinner, by the way, I'm diverting a bit. So I you know, always need to test the spirits, always look to the Bible, always make sure, don't listen to one person, look at a number of people and see where how God is speaking, right? So... I'm talking to Bill Heyman, you know, who's the, called the father of modern day prophecy. Mm-hmm. So we're having dinner and I'm sitting next to him and I'm getting this sense that we're living in the Joshua and based on my experience and the uh, end times and seeing them and why God released me to write about the storm. Mm-hmm. It wasn't because it was just, okay, now's the time. We just, you know, go ahead and, and write about it. There was a specific reason, I believe, the storm, because the storm has begun. And it is unfolding now. Mm-hmm. So I'm there with, um, and I, I'm hearing about the Joshua generation. And, you know, the Joshua generation was post-generation of Moses. Mm-hmm. They're walking into the promised land. And what they were long, walking into the promised land was just not the, this dirt under their feet. 
The promised land was where the presence of God would reside with them within the temple. That was the promise. The presence of God was the promise to them. And it would be shared with them in this, this consecrated land that he would give them where they could build the temple. Of course, the temple was destroyed. You know, now we have the Holy Spirit. But the presence of God still is the, is the one we want. We want the glory of God. So I'm sitting next to Bill Heyman and I said, I'm hearing this Joshua generation that we're living in the Joshua generation and we're, the presence of God is going to be poured out. It's going to be felt and it's going to be experienced and profound miracles, healing, dead people, yours truly, like more of, more of our kind, you know, walking out of the hospital and stuff. And, and so I said, so, uh, do you think, uh, that we're living in the Joshua generation? And he said, yes. Mm. He said, yes. He said, I don't know if I'm going to live to see it, mm. but yes, I believe. And I explained all of that, what I just mentioned to yes. him. Yes, I believe. Her. And that was a big deal for me, yeah. you know, uh, to see this very esteemed prophet uh, kind of validating what I was feeling. And that was one of the validations for writing about the storm was now we're living in the storm and what happens in the storm is has different phases as in the natural one is this calm before the storm i believe that's what we're living in today mm -hmm. and i witnessed all of these things from heaven so i was i was witnessing these things around the throne room of god in this worship but then then the lord god father god speaking from the throne with the lord jesus as, as one and yet distinct, God the Father declared, they declared, and God the Father had somehow uh, ordained where Jesus spoke forth in the execution of it. They spoke with one voice, it is finished. Mm -hmm. It is finished. And we think of those words. Now think of the, you're at the throne. You see uh, the, God the Father is like, the light is like a thousand suns or so. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing it with my spiritual eyes so I can behold this because I'm not in my body, obviously. My brain is dead. My body is dead. I'm in my spirit, uh, spirit body, the mind of Christ, as Paul talks about. And beholding all of these things, cascading through these, uh, I'll call them for lack of a better word, portals, openings through this kind of glassy blue surface, which was seemed like an ice rink, but angels and people were walking across it. <laughs> and these brigades of angels were being poured forth, mm. poured forth on earth. And then the glory was coming in. It was just this, pre this wonderful outstretching spreading of the glory of God, the light of Jesus Christ being spread forth. That's the presence. Mm. That's the glory of God. And then he cupped his hand over my eyes as he was revealing these things. And I was seeing people coming forth from the earth and it was a fragrance and the Lord God was just kind of breathing in mm. the fragrance of those coming up from, uh, from earth. But then he cupped and this is a part I have so many problems with. He cupped his hand over my eyes. And he showed me the tribulation. And I know I mean, that's the first time he had he'd done that. And it was almost as though he was just shielding me from what was happening. Where in the shields, which... You know, John referred to them as bowls. I was seeing shields being removed, lifted and lifted. And I was seeing uh, the protection of uh, the Lord God was being removed from the earth and the, the intent of, of Satan and his minions for, for all of the time since the, the fall of humankind were intending, were now being poured forth on earth. And I was seeing these things. I don't even want to describe them. I go into just a little bit of detail in the book and you can well imagine I was profusely crying I had I was just broken as I was seeing these things and I knew that I knew 
because I knew the love of God that he didn't want this to happen. He did not. That was not part of his design. He did not. And I, and I heard the a dirge throughout heaven then. I heard this only almost like, um, you know, the, the morning taps that you would hear at a funeral dirge, but not the taps. It was more uh, evocative. Mm -hmm. And I was... I was feeling this, sensing this as his eye, his hand was over my eyes, that it was the separation mm. from the Lord God that grieved him so intensely beyond any words what I can express. And he was feeling it and I could feel to some degree the intensity of the loss that he felt. And then I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, please, I can't stand this anymore. I had begun to lose my peace in heaven and he removed his hand from my eyes and I could see it no more. And then, uh, mm -hmm. and then I was seeing, I was seeing him mounting his horse. And the tassels of this horse were dipped in, uh, in red blood. And I had been, previous to that, he had, I was seeing the word, the book of life, mm -hmm. which was sealed by this red seal. And I knew that was the blood of Jesus Christ from the cross. And he had taken that book, Jesus that is, and he reached out. As, to, as if to give it to me. And I said, Lord, Lord, no, please. I, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. <laughs> and this is going to be mind-blowing. I have these translucent hands in my new spare body, and, and I could see the Holy Spirit, just, who's my closest companion, just reaching in, and they become more opaque. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit was reaching into my hands, preparing me to receive the Word of God. <laughs> And I never, I never realized the word, you know, John 1, 1, uh, the opening of the first chapter of John, the book of John. I never realized the word as a person before, mm. as God. And, and I realized that with such intensity it, when I was holding and the word was no longer just pages in a book. It was no longer just a book. It was God. It was God. And I was sensing this and I was feeling that and I knew that the Lord was imparting that, that understanding that the word of God is a spoken word, but it also is God because everything he speaks is from his personhood. And then he took it from me. And then I was seeing the, the Lord God Jesus, surrounded by these multitudes of angels about. And then Jesus spoke forth. You know, it is time, and he came forth. And I could see this, this warfare, and I could see the land of Israel. And he obliterated all of it. His glory coming forth. And I could see hordes of people, those who knew Jesus, we're on bended knee, praising him, Lord God, our Lord, our Savior, and they were, and the Jews were, were just, just expressing these in, in Hebrew and and beautiful adulation toward Jesus. And then there were those who were there who were cursing him and saying things like, "Not yet, it's not time," and just go away. Something to those of that effect, and they're expressing this torment and hating upon mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, who is coming. He was coming to redeem his children and or to, to rescue his children. Mm. And then I was with the final stage of it. And I'll end here, which I don't need to go into any more detail unless you want me to, was I was in a, in a, in a place then with Jesus that where I saw tables set up and there was a feast on these tables. And Jesus was at the head of that. And then that table, the one table, long table, luscious foods and so forth. I, would, I had no hunger, no desire to feast on anything in heaven. But here, just the appetite again was the appetite for the Lord. But then he was by my side. And I realized I was, I was on the, the new earth. Mm. And the tabernacle was over here. And it was the new tabernacle that came, was, came from heaven, and it was there on this new earth. 
and it was wonderful to behold. And I realize now that that this was this was that this was the end. Mm. This was the end. Wow. I know. Okay, I know you're emotional. I was like, mm. yeah. I thank you for sharing that. I think it gives a glimpse of some of the stuff that you'd really dive into in in the back of the book um, in that third, the last days. But I was also, I, I'm glad you talked about the Joshua generation. That was one of my questions. Um, you talk a lot about our end time assignments too. And I think that that's one thing that people don't understand is that we actually have an assignment in the end times that God is wanting us to cooperate with the Holy spirit to bring these things back uh, about um, before he comes back. And, um, and so can you talk a little bit about like the end time assignments and kind of, I mean, I can see the mandate that he gave you was to come back, was to share the truth of, of what you saw and really to reach the lost, um, and, and to connect them to, to the power of who God is and that, that Jesus is love and just all of that. So can just talk a little bit about the end time assignments and, and, and why that's important for us to understand in the context of the end of times. Mm -hmm. Well, it was in with Jesus in heaven. It was an, an entire paradigm shift. We talked earlier before I think we recorded how we're both kind of type A individuals, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we have these end goals, you know, we've got to be here, we've got to accomplish this and or this and what it might be a status or a position or something to that effect, which is very, very worldly in its, uh, in its viewpoint. But there was a time that Jesus taught me when he, after he told me I was coming back where there was a butterfly resting on my shoulder mm -hmm. and I knew that everything was intentional, that it was just a happenstance that this butterfly was there, beautiful butterfly resting on my shoulder. And then Jesus told me that this was, this butterfly represented wisdom and wisdom would guide me all of my days. And then he said something very profound relative to our assignment in the end times. He said, moment by moment, I will direct your path, your ways. Because if I revealed your purpose in full, you would not remain reliant upon me. And that struck me. I was a planner because I was looking for a blueprint from Jesus. At least tell me what I'm to do. At least give me something. Because I went through desert times after I returned. Severe desert times. I mean, I couldn't walk. I couldn't. My brain was not functioning. I had bleeds in my brain. So I couldn't even talk uh, legibly. Um, I went through some tough stuff. But I. But aside from the, that tough stuff... I just wasn't finding my, my place. Mm. I just, I, I went back into, I had to support my family because we were, anyway, I'd talk about how we, I needed to, you know, f put uh, food on the table. And I knew something was profoundly different in the way I had to approach things. I enjoyed things more mm. because every moment I was looking for opportunities. How do I pray for somebody? Do I give a word of encouragement? Do I have an opportunity in my position to influence maybe uh, something more positively for Christ? All of these minutia of life became more pronounced. But Debbie, there was an instance um, that kind of uh, kind of revealed this thing in full. Because when I was in heaven, I saw a beggar. Um, and he was, uh, I think, feeding some people or giving them, I assume, was, well, food. I don't know, food in heaven, but something. And, and the Lord Jesus said, to those who have served, will be served even more so in heaven, uh, to that effect. And so I was just, I was out on, uh, we have a, a place along the uh, harbor in San Diego, and I was walking. And again, living with, we call it intention, which is intentionality, but it's more so than that. Living in the moment, you know, Lord, what should I do? And I've seen people, how should I pray for them? And I saw this homeless man and he was walking and um, this wave kind of crashed against the rocks and there was, there was a spray against my face and I was, 
I thought I would joke with the Lord, you know, because I know he has a sense of humor because um, he created all of us, right? So, and, you know, he, he did smile on occasion. There were times I won't get into. But anyway, I knew there, I knew I could, I could joke with him. But I said, did you just spit on me? <laughs> and because uh, I was remembering that, that passage in uh, the Bible says, because you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Uh, that's the most guttural phrase I know of in the Bible. So I was thinking about that and I was expecting a response from the Holy Spirit like, oh, no, 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 I didn't. <laughs> that's silly. No, but I didn't hear anything. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Oh, no. You know, maybe I'm lukewarm, lukewarm in the moment. So so um, I, I go up to the homeless man and I give him like five or ten bucks. And uh, and then and then uh, I hear the Holy Spirit saying something like, I'm still spewing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. And so I went up to the, uh, the homeless man again and I said, do you know Jesus? And he said, oh, I know Jesus, you know, and all of this and that. And I said, well, he loves you and all of these trite things, right? So I thought, well, maybe that did it, right? In the moment of t a moment of life. And so, and so the, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit saying something like, hmm, still spewing, you know? So I'm thinking, Lord, give me guidance, wisdom, what I'm supposed to do. So I'm kind of a clean freak, if you will. And so I'm... I'm I knew I had to go up and give him a hug. He's, I mean, this guy smelled like a brewery. I mean, he really smelled bad. So I go up to him and I give him a hug. And I thought, well, Lee, is that it? Is that it? You know, and it wasn't. There's was silence from the Holy Spirit. And so I'm listening to this still small voice. And I said, oh, no, I have to invite him for lunch. So I... Invite him for lunch is a fish and chips place. And we sit down and we're having fish and chips. And he is telling me his life story. Mm. He was a somewhat of a normal kid, right? And all these things and how his life went downhill. And then after I heard his story, I had the opportunity because I invested in his life. And I said, you want to know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Because we didn't have these conversations, so we were friends at this time. Um, he had had probably no communication with uh, people, real communication. And uh, he said, yes. And that was the open window to share with him, to receive Christ. And I thought I'd been, I've interviewed people who have seen uh, people in heaven who had not yet died. Mm. And uh, I thought in my mind, Lord, is this the beggar that I saw in heaven? Is mm. this this man? And, and it was the most amazing thing because I look back on that experience and it was one of the best meals I've ever had in my life, mm. moment by moment. In these times, we're looking for some grandiose purpose. You know, how is it different? Well, it's different because... It's going to end for that man. And I saw the black hole in, in heaven. I saw the blackest of black holes in heaven. And it was for, and I knew, and the Lord Jesus showed me, these were the lost purposes, the moments in life that had been wasted and they will never be recouped. And I realized that man's life may have never been saved, never come to know it. He would be in heaven, not because of me, just because I listened, just because I listened. There are more of that, more opportunities. You know, the Bible talks about that the field is ripe, but the sowers are, uh, the, the, those who are, those, the, the, the sowers are few. Yeah. And, and the, it's so true today more than ever, perhaps, in these end times, as people are seeing these horrific things that are being done. I mean, it seems like evil is reigning over this earth in wicked ways. Why do people see it? But this is the opportunity. This is, this is a ripe field because pe other people see it too. You may not think people that you would think, oh, they're, they're in, in this, they're, they're in agreement with it. No, they're at the effect of it. And so, th the 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 fields are ripe. Now is the time to be to be looking for those moments in life that we can be 
effective, but they're going to hurt. They're going to be ugly. They're going to be, you know, it, it's going to be like hugging the and having lunch eventually with the Holy Spirit. I'll finish with this. So the Holy Spirit said to me, as we were having this meal at the end of it, he said, because you did it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. We know it from the Bible, but it was so true, and it's so true today, because you've done it for the least of these. So don't look to be on the world stage. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, just don't look for it. I never wanted it, still don't want it, but look for it because your effect is so profound because he sees us as though each person is the only person that really matters. Yeah. And so when you look at that one person, what Debbie affects in her, in her getting out there with her writings and her books and her podcasts is a lot of people. But what you do for that one person is the most important thing. Yeah to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he doesn't see us as masses. He sees us, each person, as the most important person in the world. I think that's so good, Randy. I think it's so important for us to remember, too, especially those that are looking for the escape button, too, for the rapture. Like, when is the rapture coming? That that we still have things that we can do and people to touch because he wants none to perish. He wants to give everybody every opportunity mm -hmm. to um, say yes to him, to come to a saving knowledge and, and experience the person of love who is Jesus. And so um, I... I love that. I love, I loved, um, what you said, cause I know you have interviewed so many people with NDEs and, and all kinds of stuff. And for you to have that experience in heaven and then ask and wonder, was this the man I saw in heaven, but that you were, but the other part of that is that you were so pressing in to hear the father that that you were not willing to just hand him money and walk by like our, our time. How many times have I walked into a place and when I am on, I have my agenda, I have my thing, I have a timetable and yet I have the most profound encounters with the one that you never would have had the opportunity to have if you just had your head down and stayed focused. But when you listen to the Holy spirit, um, and I agree with you. You started, I love this. You started by saying that, that this is a different time and different season and, and having this lukewarm relationship with, with the Lord is not going to cut it anymore. We've got to go deeper and bringing it back to, you know, God spitting on your face with the sea breeze. Right. And, <laughs> and I'm still spewing. And are we going to be attentive to that? Because it's not, it's not about, yes, the money was a blessing to him, I'm sure, but it was the personal connection. Mm -hmm. It was the having that I'm going to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. with the smell, but I'm going to sit down face to face and have a meal with this man that opens the door to eternity for him. Um, because it's not about us. It's about the one. And, um, it really is about that. And so thank you for that. I, I, um, <laughs> See, I have so many things, but I, I love, I love how we started and we ended at the same place because, um, I think that's really on the heart of the father for people to understand is, is we can't be lukewarm anymore. We can't be, you know, choose side mm -hmm. <laughs> because not going to gut it better choose and get hot, get hot for the Lord, get over there and, and listen to him. And thank you for sharing about the butterfly. Cause that was one of my questions. All of my questions you actually touched on, even though I never really asked them. So I love that. Um, my favorite part of the book though, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you this because I love the reunion with Jesus in Tahoe because uh, from all of the um, NDs from your book and even, you know, the 90 minutes in heaven with um, John Piper, right? Wrote that one. Yes. Okay. Don Piper. And, yeah. Piper, yeah. Don Piper. Yeah. That, that in reading those, you would think we would think that you're going to come back and not have any struggles. You're going to come back and have this intimate mm. relationship with the Lord and that everything is going to be like, Ooh, so great. And yet your story in, in both dying, um, to meet Jesus and in revelations from heaven. And when you share your own story here in heaven storm, you really talk about the trials and tribulations that you still walk through, um, when he sent you back and, and yet you had this reunion with Jesus in Tahoe. This is my favorite. This is, 
this was my favorite part because I don't know. I'm going to cry. I don't know how many times I have said, Lord, are you even there? Like you will have these great experiences and then we'll walk through these trials or tribulations. And we think we've heard from him. And yet it seems like he's not there. He is there. Scripture tells us he's there. He is there. Um, but you had this profound meeting with him. And I was like, ha, oh, like that spoke to my soul so much. And my spirit was like shouting a hallelujah. We were been trying to tell you, Debbie. So can you just talk just a little bit about that? Because I think that this is so important for people to understand. Like, yes, the book is about heaven storm. Yes. It's about preparing us for the end of times. Yes. It's about our end time assignments. Um, and the Joshua generation, there's so much, there's so much that you cover in this book. This, this has now become one of my favorite books, Randy. And that's saying a lot because your revelation from heaven was at the top of my list. <laughs> and so, um, but, but I think there's a lot of people that, that wonder, um, how you can go from a throne room experience in heaven because you died and then he sends you back and then feeling like you weren't connected, but yet you were. So can you just talk about that? I'm going to shut up cause I'm rambling. No, it's, it's a great question because a lot of people assume that because you've had this experience in heaven that you're not going to have any more problems or challenges. And a lot of people say, well, I wish I had your experience. And my common answer to, uh, to or try to answer is, well, you got to die first, right? Are you willing to do that? Um, but what what I guess the parallel I would I would tell is, you know, if you were let's say you go on your greatest vacation of all time. Right. And you're there for, let's say, two weeks or three weeks and you're loving it and it's phenomenal and you come back and all of a sudden you come back to the house and you come to your behind in your work or whatever you have to do. And all of a sudden uh, you're not there in your vacation. Well, that's that's really a superficial uh kind of picture but it's not even the the great vacation the paradise and all of that it's the relationship with jesus which is unimpeded it is continual and it is it, it is intimate to the the 20th infinite degree so you've got that everything you always desired everything you always wanted and the most important thing is being intimate with Jesus Christ forever, yeah. always. Well, forever, no. So that's the part that leads into coming back. So the forever part is promised and it will be, but not here. It's not been established yet. So I'm returning. I've got damaged organs, damaged valves, even to this day. If I don't, if I don't walk or whatever, my uh, body starts to swell. I mean, I've got, they don't work anymore. Um, and so I've got still to this day, I have to take medications and all of that just to stay alive. Uh, so you may look at this person. I'm, I'm, I'm damaged goods, as they say. So I'm, I'm back. I've got this brain bleed. I've got you know, all of these things going on. I can't walk. And I've got to be in surgery because I have a new job to support the family. And I collapse there and I'm going all through these gyrations and I'm depressed. I'm actually depressed because not only because of the physical impediments, but because, Lord, I was with you all the time. And now I've got to relate to you in a different way back in my body and with my stinking thinking, my brain, you know, I, I, I just miss you. I miss you. I miss you. I miss you. I want that. I miss you so, so much. I want to be able to touch you. I want to be, I want to feel your whiskers. I want to, so... I'm praying, Lord, not not for some visitation or anything. I'm just praying for that intimacy. So I'm going to a men's retreat, and I'm there to uh, to help with uh, some of the teaching. And in Lake Tahoe, we had a family place there uh, where I was staying, and then we had my friend's place, and he was hosting this in his home. And so. I'm just, we're having a prayer time. All of a sudden, bang, I hit the floor. I mean, it's amazing my head wasn't a concussion just doing that. I was down on the floor and I'm just out. 
And the men said that it was, I was probably on the floor for at least 45 minutes. And so I'm, I'm communing with the Lord. I'm, just, I'm, I'm in this intimate space with the Lord while I'm out, slain by the Spirit, as it said. I, I finally ease up, and I'm standing like a drunken man now. I'm just, you know, woozy. And then I start declaring in these kind of prophetic ways. This man, this man was been abused. No, he never shared that, but I said, it, those, those, those linger, and I didn't offend him by saying you were abused as a child. I just said, those things that happened to you, and he knew exactly what it was. The, the Lord is striking them and healing you right now in Jesus' name. And wow, and on the floor he goes. And I'm talking to another man who's having an affair, right? right. And nobody knows that. I didn't know it. But I'm saying, that, that, that relationship you have is over now is over no relation whatsoever the lord god says if you do not judgment will come upon you so I'm, it's like out of character for me right and he goes he goes down <laughs> and it's, it's going on and then all these things i mean like so it's like the fire from this big fireplace is coming out spiritually speaking and then and then it's over it's like i go limp and I'm now what, what's commonly called kind of drunk in the spirit. I'm, I'm physically, dr well, in a similar way, drunk. I'm not drunk. I had no alcohol or anything. Right. So I'm drunk. And, and these guys and, and are trying, having to support me. Well, I drove to this house. So Big Dan, we call him, big guy. He, he's supporting me with another guy. They're actually, you know, lifting me into the car. And Big Dan drives to our house in Tahoe. And they're upstairs, I'm downstairs, and I'm just in bed because I can't, you know, I'm, I'm like a drunken man in the spirit. These two gargantuan angels are on either side of the bed. I mean, I've seen with my spiritual eyes, but not in a way that I'm actually living it in heaven. I mean, it's different. Yeah. But I'm still seeing this. It's They're more um, ethereal looking. Yeah. Uh, whereas in heaven, there were there were actual people like you, you and I would be only big, you know. <laughs> and they're at either side, and they're tall, you know. They're reaching to the ceiling, and they've got these swords, and they're very regal looking, standing there. Mm -hmm. And I turn to one of them, and I say, "Who are you?" And he says, do not speak to me because you are in the presence of the Lord mm. or God. Jesus is there. He's with me and again in a different way than heaven, but he's there. And, and I can sort of see him in an ethereal way with my, with my spiritual eyes, but more sensing him in the koinonia way. And... We're just bantering back and forth. I mean, we're making small talk. We're making small talk. And then we're laughing together. I said, Lord, you know, it's just, I said, why did, why did you create broccoli? Instead of making it, instead of tasting like broccoli, you could have made it like chong. All of these really silly things we're talking about. I go over to, to brush my teeth and I said, you know, couldn't you do something about this toothpaste? You know, just really superficial, silly, silly talk. Silly. And we're just, just like, like old friends. We're bantering back and forth. It was incredible. So different from heaven. But in a familiar way that I knew he knew I needed. We're like chumming it together. And, and then toward the end, he said this. Uh, he said, and I'm, I'm now surmising it, but he said, tell them not to ignore me anymore. And it got serious. And I knew I had to be the messenger of that. Yeah. And then, uh, and then he left. He left. Well, it was healing for me. It healed me because I wasn't depressed anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next morning, the, the guy said, they had heard these from downstairs. They said, what were you having, who were you having a conversation with? 
I'm like, I can't tell them Jesus is, but I do because they're believers. And they said, wow, wow. You were talking with Jesus. I said, you're talking back to me. It's like, and, and I'm cogent now, but I'm still kind of like the after effect. I'm having, um, I'm still, what do they call it when you're drunk uh, that you're, um, you have this hangover yeah. it's a pleasant hangover right <laughs> so i'm i'm able to drive i'm driving there i'm smelling things more intensely the snow has fallen the birds chirping everything is just so like i'm in the moment and we get there and I walk through the door. I know the men are kind of looking at me in a strange way. It's like, so I immediately descend on the stairs to call my wife, Renee. And I said, Renee, I was with him again. I was with him. He was there. And she's, she's like, tell me about it. Tell me about it. I said, I, 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 I didn't know if I could. And I, she, and I said, but I can't go back to the cabin. I can't go back there. I can't lay in that bed. I can't be in there. And I said, I've got to come home. She said, come home. I want to hear all about it. You need to come home. And I know I have to come home. So I caught a ride to the airport and I flew back. And, uh, and that was my experience at uh, Lake Tahoe. From that point on, I was good. I was good. Uh, no depression. He was with me. He gifted me with that experience. And... Uh, and I finished my tour, if you will, in, uh, in surgery. We were minimally invasive heart surgery, you know. Uh, I was praying over patients. We never lost a patient, which was rare. Uh, all of these miracles were happening during that time. And then, um, then I had left because I knew that it, I just couldn't do it anymore. And that was the desert time. And Debbie there for, for years. Mm -hmm. But I, I always had that experience in Tahoe to bring heaven mm -hmm. in a very uh, similar but different way that gave me the strength to carry on before the God TV episode and then everything changed. And then I realized the thing I didn't want to do was the thing that God wanted me to do. And of course, the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being obedient. Thank you for sharing that because when I was reading it, I was profoundly touched by it. When you're sharing it, I'm over here crying again. I'm profoundly touched by it because, you know, we all long for that. And yet it is, it's all about the relationship and the intimacy with him. And he's so good and he's so good. And I, I just, mm, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for that. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, share with us how we can connect with you, how we can get copies of Heaven Storm. And, um, yeah. Well, uh, the website is randyk.org. Uh, and the book is, is all over. So, I mean, all over, just like your books, you know, Amazon and, you know, uh, Barnes and Noble, all of that stuff. But mm -hmm. by the way, I've got to say, I've got to say, my sister, yeah. that I love your books. I encourage the audience, get your books. I've read them. I love them. I, was, I had the honor of uh, interviewing you on, on my show. And people love you. Uh, your ministry is phenomenal. I think I've told you before that you're my favorite prophet because you do it with a smile. Uh, I mean, not many prophets or prophetesses, whatever you want to say, are uh, are just joyous, friendly, connecting, charismatic individuals. A lot of them are very stern, mm -hmm. very kind of uh, to the point and, and sometimes almost you know, you know yes. what I'm talking about. Yes, I know exactly <laughs> you're what just, you're talking about. <laughs> you give a prophecy and you feel uplifted, edified and and joyful because of who you are. And Thank so uh, that comes through in everything you do in your writings. And uh, yeah, so I encourage people to uh, to read your books. Thank you, Randy. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. I know when I was interviewing that one time and you told me that you read my book on the airplane, I was like, what? You read my books? <laughs> yes. Oh, I yes. Know. Yes. I know. I was really touched with that. I had a good time on your show too. And, and, uh, 
connecting with you. I, I just always love to have you back. I will always have you on the show anytime you write another book because you're one of my favorite people on the planet. Well, likewise, I hope this is, I hope the end of it, I hope the Lord doesn't call for, there's no more really story to tell except for the story that, that we tell and others who are in the space of writing about the things, uh, not just of heaven, but the things of God. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I, I, I love what you do and who you are. You're a good friend and I thank you and thank you. pray blessings on you and your family and your audience. Well, thank you, Randy. And the same to you and your family. It was great to be, um, to meet Renee when we were on your, um, virtual book launch party. That was a lot of fun. Um, I, I like to, you know, this, I always like to end the podcast episode by seeing if there was anything that you wanted to share that we didn't talk about, or if there's, you know, anything that you want to pray over the audience for, um, just going to give you the last few minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, thank you. Um, well, I know there are people in your audience who are feeling like uh, maybe God has abandoned them, hasn't answered prayers, perhaps, like they want that intimate experience, but haven't had it. And if I only did, I would be so much better. But I just pray now that the Lord would uh, give you a profound encounter with him. Uh, maybe it not, may not be in uh, like a Lake Tahoe. Um, it will probably not be until you die or maybe are raptured like I had. Yeah. But I just ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you have that profound encounter. Maybe it's a stillness that you have. Maybe it's just being in this place of peace. Maybe it's maybe it's something audible. Maybe it's not. Whatever it is, God will speak to you in the way that is personal to you because that's the way he speaks to each of us. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, um, you need to know, do that now. You need, really need to know. There's no promise of tomorrow. I died when I was seemingly perfectly healthy. But moreover, we don't know when God is going to call us uh, home or, you know, our time is going to end. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be out of this place. So he died on the cross. I sacrificed himself on the cross for you willingly for the penalty of your sins. That means you have to acknowledge that you need forgiveness. So you ask forgiveness of him. Uh, and then you invite him to be Lord of your life. And then you ask him to guide you all the days of your life. And then you can't be ashamed. You can't be, you know, a closet Christian, not in these end times. You got to be there outward. You got to put yourself on the line. Mm -hmm. It's just no more simple than what that, I think. And that is that uh, you can't be lukewarm. You got to be there. You got to be in your Bible. You got to be spending time with him. You got to be doing it, as Paul said, uh, unceasingly. You know, it's not just, a, you know, one hour a day or 10 minutes a day, whatever it is. You got to be a full time believer in Jesus Christ. And I'll end it with that. Yeah, that's great. That's good. That's a perfect way to end it with an invitation to come on in to the kingdom so important well randy k heaven storm you guys got to go get a copy of this book randy again thank you for being with me today on the podcast i really appreciate it thank you debbie it's been an honor and a privilege uh thank you and i want to thank you for listening to dare to hear the podcast where we encourage you to dare to hear the voice of god if you've been blessed at all in any way we are going to ask that you do a couple things first of all share this episode out so we can get the message out about randy k and his new book heaven stormed and then if you're at a place where you can like us leave us a review um or subscribe we'd be honored if you would do that i'm debbie kitterman i look forward to having you join me next week on another episode until well then, God bless and goodbye. Says me.